Hey you guys, how you doing? Just going to share a couple of quick games. Um, so I've done a massive, massive tilt in Rapid uh, from 16.50 down to, well, currently 15.30 um, over a few days, but it doesn't matter. You know, the, the way I see it is that you know, it's in my range, so it means my performance has dipped. I haven't got worse at chess, I've just been performing less well. And then you dip down, and it's going to want to return to normal. And if you work hard, then you'll do all right. So I've just played two games against the same player, Due Pedoni, from Italy. And um, so I did 84 accuracy in 77, which in 10 minute rapid is not bad. So I'll go through the games. Um, interestingly as well, I also uh, played my very first over the board game against a, a stranger last night. Went out to my local chess club for the first time. Chesterfield Chess Club, and uh, bizarrely as well, bumped into, um, so there were, what, four other, other players down there. I played four games, lost them all, but so, you know, they were quite close and quite interesting, but what's really fascinating is I learned quite a lot um, from, from the experience of playing over the board that I'll, I'll just chat a little bit about before we go through these games. Um, but yeah, a really funny thing was there's a lad down there, a bit, bit younger than me, and he said, I know, I, I know you from somewhere, you know, where are you from? And, you know, I said, well, I don't know, Do you, did you used to play badminton? Do you play rugby? He says, no, 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 it's not that. I said, well, I've got a YouTube channel. He says, chess boot club, that's just chess boot camp, that's it. How bizarre is that? We've got 7,000 subscribers in a world of 7 billion people. So there's literally a one in a million, one in a million chance of, <laughs> of that. But hey, at a chess boot club, uh, chess, chess club. You know, the chances are slightly, slightly improved, but how, that, that's, so, that's just really funny. So, um, yeah, a tummy tickle, I think. Username, new friend. Nice to meet you, pal. Okay, so anyway, um, two, two, two big insights from playing over the board. Number one, it's, it's so different, you know, because here I can, I'm looking at my screen now, I can scan the whole board and my eyes can zip around like that. When you're over the board, you're at this angle, and um, it is a very, very different prospect. It's like I could read the board, but I was a lot more comfortable in the opening than than later on because opening, you know, I kind of knew what I was doing, and I, I tried to be a bit a bit clever with openings and do kind of what I do online. And it's a very different prospect when you are playing without a time control because we, we were just playing for fun, right? But there was no real limit. We didn't have clocks. Um, and the other thing is, the really key thing is that, that without that, you know, when you're not playing 10 minute, when you're actually playing in a more classical kind of way, the, you know, the bad move really does begin to tell. So what I played, I mean, the first guy I played was probably much higher rated, like 1800 rated. Um, the second guy I played... I think is a bit lower rated than me on chess.com at rapid, but he th really took his time. And, and if we took maybe 30 minutes over that game, I really struggled to keep my attention for, the, for that long. I, my mind started to wander and, you know, towards the end, I just pushed a blunder move. Um, and I don't really know why. It's really odd. It's, it's, it's just a very different experience, but it's, it's fascinating. To, to get into and but what's really going to be interesting is in two weeks I've got my first match my first match against a flesh and blood meat flavoured human which is going to be very very interesting face to face 75 minutes each that's two and a half hours potentially over the board <sighs> wish me luck so I'm playing I'm playing bottom board for the second team and uh, we'll see how we go anyway so over to these games um, just lots of fun really so the first game, I've got the white pieces, and um, we get into normal kind of king's knight, kings and, and knights out, and then we get the Ponziani. Now, whether we have the Italian, we have the Spanish, um, or the Ponziani, or the bishop's opening as well, without the knights and the bishop comes out to here, right? Um, you could you can always play f5. So I played f5. This is the Ponziani counter gambit, and I haven't checked out. Um, so let's just quickly go to um, 
the Explorer. And I'm just going to see uh, how do I do my games, uh, all of them, as black. So I probably haven't played this uh, X to flip the board on chess.com. It's F on Lee Chess, by the way. Okay, so this is this, and then that's the Ponziani. And I've played F5 seven times. Looks like I've won four. Okay, so this game. And then if he takes, however, Ponziani counter cover accepted, White's won every time. Interesting. Okay, anyway, back to the game. So here he doesn't take, brings out the bishop. So this is now, we've transposed now. No, we haven't. So this is almost like a, um, a Janish, but he's got this extra one in there. So I take... He takes my knight. Now, this is actually a blunder. Because on the next move, I take his knight. Because obviously I've got two pieces at my disposal, at, uh, at my mercy. Um, whichever one I take, the other one can escape. However, I take the knight. And the problem with this move is that he could have recaptured with the bishop and maintained his pawn structure. We'd have been absolutely fine, right? Uh, and, and in fact, that is what he does in the game. So what I should have done here is probably captured the bishop and then his knight would have had to move and I maintain my pawns in the center. Okay, so we do this. He recaptures with, with the bishop and now he's, he's kind of better. So, however, um, I have two central pawns and I have my, you know, I haven't lost a pawn. So, um, knight out to here. I'm not worried about, obviously, queen h5 check, which is something that I think about a lot. Bishop h5 check is a possibility. So, you know, I thought, well, let's kind of prevent that. He plays it anyway. So this is, what, one, two, three, you know, he's, so he is, he's made four bishop moves now in four turns. So bishop b5 takes, takes, and then to here. I just push g6. Right? So now he's, he's facing being quite behind on development because he's now got to lose another tempo doing that. So back the bishop goes, and I grab the center with d5. This is something that the engine's been bitching at me for ages. You know, like the number of times it says <coughs> either <coughs> if you didn't take hanging pawn or you failed to grab the center, um, yes, thank you, fish. I'm learning. Okay, so anyway. So d4. And now I decide to push on, right? Let's grab this. Let's, let's start to cramp white style a bit if we can. I don't think his king's going that way. His king's going to be castling kingside. So let's kind of open up a channel here, but potentially lock out some of um, white's remaining minor pieces, all of which are now kind of on the wrong side. So castles, he, he does. Bishop d6. Now just, you know, idly looks at h2. Um, <clears throat> and now he decides to challenge in the center. So this is the point at which you have to go, okay, right, let's not freak out. It's only tension. It's not a, not a bad thing. If he takes if he takes here, what do I do? Well, I'm just going to recapture with the knight. And I've improved my knight. And then my knight is on an outpost because there ain't no pawns that can dislodge it. So happy days. Bring the bishop out anyway, that even gives me options. So now I'm thinking, develop the queen, then I can castle queen side, and I'm all good. Sorry about the, uh, we have a, our little cat has come into season, bless her soul. So she's not very happy. <laughs> so, bishop comes down here, and I'm thinking, am I worried about, I mean, what's it going to do? What's, what's the idea? <coughs> Morgan, shut up. Bless her soul. So, no, I'm not worried about this bishop. If he comes here, I'm just going to play rook g8 and line it up with the king, and he's doing me a favour. So, I'm okay here. So, lift the queen. In hindsight, I think I should have probably put the queen on here, but you'll see that in a minute. Okay, so, he takes there, and I take with a knight. Now, if my queen had been here, you see, remember my bishop's looking at h2. My queen had been here... I could have jumped straight into there, maybe on the next turn. So now he plays a4. This is not accurate play, I don't think, for my opponent. Now I slide my queen over to e7. So I've kind of wasted a move there, right? But, you know, 
it seemed like the right thing to do. So queen's going to come in here, threaten mate, but also fork the bishop. Queen to here, and I, did, I, I now weigh this up. I think, look, yes, you can attack my pawn, right? You could even take this pawn, but I have a greater threat. My greater threat is called checkmate, right, here. But I'm also attacking a minor piece. So you're going to have to do something, and you can't play your bishop back to here because I just snatch it off. And I still have a mate threat, right? Um, so he has a think for 9.9 .9 seconds and goes there and f drops mate. Simple as that, right? So that is not 1500 level play from my opponent, I don't think. But, you know, I, I'm starting to, I'm really getting this, this feeling like I'm, I'm getting into my gambit lines and getting into the spirit of the gambit. Uh, where I'm, I'm not being afraid of sharp, dangerous, double-edged situations. So anyway, with that in mind, he says, go on, let's have another one. So I go, fair enough, and I've got the white pieces. And I know what you're thinking. Ben's going to play a Vienna. Well, no, Ben's feeling even spicier than that. So Ben goes for a Danish. Okay, <clears throat> because... Let's just flick over to opening Explorer here, right? This is my whole career on chess.com so far with the white pieces and e4 and e5 played, okay? Knight c3, oh, sorry, this is rapid, okay? Rapid only. Knight c3, the Vienna game, I've played 677 of those in rapid with a 62% win rate, not to be sniffed at, right? Knight f3, there are probably a lot of scotches, you know, in there. King's Knight variation. Played 485 times with a 56% win rate. Again, very reasonable. D4, the center game. 311 of those. 69% uh, percent wins with that. Okay. And then the only real other one that I've played, Bishop C4. And then a couple of King's Gambits and that's it. And I've played F3 once, which is a stupid move. So, interestingly, even at Rapid, my whole career on Rapid on chess.com, the center game, 69% above 63 for the Bishops game, and um, 62 for the Vienna. Interesting. And the, you know what? The Danish Gambit is one of the more reliable uh, Gambit lines. It is, it, you know, it's not too dodgy. It really isn't. Even if your opponent plays well, even if your opponent knows the supposed kind of equalization line, which is not a refutation line, then it's okay. So I'm, you know, I'm toying. I, I'm toying with it. Anyway, so we don't go into the Danish here. Centre game, he takes the first pawn. I offer the second pawn. This is now the Danish gambit. And he declines with c5. Now, I've, I don't know what to do in this instance. Okay, so when we don't know what to do, we go back to our principles, because I haven't studied the Danish or played it recently. So I bring out my bishop anyway, which is the move that I would have done if he'd taken the pawn. So, and this gives him the opportunity still to take the pawn. Okay, and then I'll, I'll, I'll think about what to do. And then he might take the other one, and then we might get, you know, the situation I understand, or even queen b3, right? Lots of ideas. Or, or queen h5 or queen f3. Right, all the time threatening mate on here. So, okay, anyway. So he brings his knight out. And here again, I generally know what to do. You push the pawn to e5 with tempo. And he comes in. So, actually, would f3 here have trapped the knight? He can't go there because of the bishop. He can't go there. I think f3 would have trapped the knight, actually. I need to remember this pattern. I think that was probably a mistake. I played queen f3. And now he plays this. Now I do have the option here. In fact, I probably should have done that. He can capture on passant, but then he can capture backwards with the knight, defend f7. Hmm. So this is interesting. So he's defending his knight with a pawn. He's also attacking my bishop. And we have a non passant option. You can only play it immediately or never at all. I decide to drop the bishop back and put two attackers on the knight. 
queen comes out now attacking my pawn. So, bishop takes knight, pawn takes, queen takes. Queen's attacking my pawn, but it's also defended. We have a very interesting sharp position. The only stuff out in the board really is queens. He brings a knight out. I bring out my king's knight. So I'm now ready to castle kingside. We have tension also between these pawns. Okay, he pushes now, preparing to fianchetto this bishop and add a third attacker onto this pawn. So what do we do? Bishop g5, defended by the knight. Okay, and it's, it's weird, isn't it? Because the, the more you play the same kind of openings, you, you, know that you, have, you know what the tools are in your tool belt. You just reach for it. It's like, oh yeah, I can bring a bishop out and hit that queen because I know she's on e7 and etc. And this isn't playable because I just take it. And then I have a fork on the queen and the rook. So I figured that out. But black plays anyway and gets himself forked. This is not good. Queen moves, win a rook. Okay, it's now winning again. So he's not on his best game today, this fella. He comes out and attacks my queen, and I just drop back to e2. I'm okay here. If he wants to take this pawn, happy days. I develop my knight, get castled, centralized rooks. There's missing pawns, no worries. Well, there's a semi-open d file. This bishop can always come back and pair itself up with his pawn, and that's what we do. And it comes with tempo because we're hitting a rook. Uh, so I'm just thinking forward, forward, forward all the time. Rook comes to there, so now he's got one, two attackers on here. It's, a it's defended though one, two, three times right now. But I'm not happy about my uh, queen and my king lined up. So here I decide to take his pawn. I want to open up space towards this king if I can. Takes, and then I just castle. All right? So equal trade of pawns, castles. But now, the only thing in front of his king it, on this completely open C file is his own knight. So he pushes now. So we have a little bit of a threat here. Dave the D-pawn is starting to, you know, get into the mix a little bit. So queen up here, just get out of trouble. And I'm thinking maybe knight here, pair up the knights. So we're thinking solidity around the king now because I've got enough activity. I've got a very nice bishop here. I've got two rooks that want to get into the game. And these two knights can just hold the fort, you know, around this area of the board. I'll be quite happy with that. That's, that's fine. No worries. So his bishop comes out now. I can't capture because it drops the queen. But, I mean, I would get a bishop and a rook for a queen. So it's not the end of the world, but then this bishop falls as well. So knight come out to d2, connect the rooks, finally complete development on move 19 and solidify everything. So now he takes this pawn. I'm not worried, because I, with this knight moving, he's undefended a, a seven now. He takes my knight, so I recapture with my other knight, okay? This is an important knight. It guards a key square, h2. Pay attention to this square. It comes in um, to the proceedings later on. Very important. So now he grabs my bishop. Oh yeah, he's taking my pawn out. I grab his pawn. We trade knights, so now, okay. So now he's no longer a full rook down because he's regained a minor piece. But look at these kings. Look at this guy. He's clinging onto one little bit of wood, isn't he? This guy has a complete fortress around him. This is the setup that you want. King defends all three of these pawns, right? The rook defends that. This pawn defends the knight, this knight defends that. You know, the only way to put an icing on the cake there would be to add a bishop, also defending these pawns as well, or two bishops, right? But anyway, project kill Bill. So we come in with check. Now, I know if he comes here, I can capture this pawn with check again. If he comes here, I can swing a rook over. So he goes to d7, I take the pawn, check. Bishop blocks, okay. Now here, I guess rook c1, I'm threatening to take the bishop. Um, but I swing the queen round with another check. King has to defend this rook, so these are the only legal moves. Oops.
So the king goes back to d8. I swing across again with another check. This is what you have to do, front foot stuff. Now he blocks the check with a piece. And what you have to remember is that any time you block a check with a piece, you pin the piece. Okay, so black here is here voluntarily pinned his own light squared bishop. And this is important because it means this bishop now cannot move, literally cannot move. Okay, however, uh, so I, I now drop back and, and remove the troublesome Dave, which I'm happy about. Queen now comes in. Now, what's the point of this? The point of this is that he's looking at a potential checkmate. If this knight ever abandons its post, then the only defender of that pawn is the king. Queen dives in. Boom. Right? It's desperate, desperate times. He's five behind now. He's down in exchange and three pawns. So he's going to have to find, pull something out of the bag if he's going to win this. Okay? Rook A to D1, obviously. And now I'm simply threatening mate in one. So he's got to do something. Lifts a rook to defend the bishop. My other rook now comes across harassing this rook, but it's okay because he's got two more squares on the seventh rank that he can defend the bishop. So now, queen to here, and I'm saying, hey, let's trade queens. Doesn't bother me one bit. I've got two rooks, you know. Obviously, he doesn't want to do that. So the queen now swings up to here, still looking at h2, which is still defended by the knight. Queen into the corner, h8, check. Um... And I kind of miscalculated this because I thought the only move he has, because the king can't go here or here because my rook, and can't stay on the back rank. So the only move he has is to block with a rook. But what I didn't realise was that the queen's also defending. So I come back out again, and now again I'm threatening mate. So the rook has to come back to f7. So what would you play here? Now I figure out that it's time to unleash the horse. So out comes the horse. Now, what's interesting about this is it blocks this bishop's view of h2. So we don't have any checkmate threat ideas. Also, the king has an escape square. Okay, but I'm threatening the rook. I'm also threatening the bishop. Notice if I take the bishop, rook takes his mate, blah, blah, blah. So what does he do? Moves the rook across. And this is interesting. Because now, for example, if knight takes here, okay, he's got rook takes there. I have to recapture with that. Then queen there. I might still be all right. Might still be okay. But I find this, right? Lovely, lovely move. i very, very happy with this move, right? Taking advantage of the pinned piece and forking the king and the rook. And this is the beginning of the end, because king goes there, capture with check, and now it's just a case of, yeah, I'm still aware that I've got two pieces looking at this, but I'm also aware that the king's got f1. Um, grab this bishop, and this pins this bishop, but it can still support the queen. So in comes the queen, I come to here, and now, after queen h1, he's out of checks. King e2, right? And now he can't come here, that queen, because I, I can just snatch it off. Right, this bishop's going to fall. I just need to move my knight, win the bishop, and it's going to be game over very quickly. And my opponent resigns. So, yeah, just toying. Toying with going back to the Danish. Maybe just have a little tour. You know, leave Vienna, leave Austria for a while and, and go back to Denmark. Because it does lead to an awful lot of fun games. And you know what? Even in Rapid, I'm having great results with the Danish. Um, so I saw a video with uh, Levi Rosman and Hikaru uh, not too long ago. They went through all the gambits, you know, all the gambit, major main gambits that they could think of, and they ranked them in, in uh, how kind of serious they are. And the Danish was right in the top tier, as in this is a perfectly playable gambit at high level. Um, so, yeah, I enjoy it. And that's the whole point of this thing. It's a game. We're meant to enjoy ourselves. So there you go. Uh, so yeah, wish me luck in a couple of weeks. My first over the board match for a, a chess club. Should be a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, really, it's really making me think about uh, this. Um, the, the importance of properly. Th it sounds ridiculous. Thinking about your moves. Yeah? 
really taking the time, really going through the checklist and not pushing a move that, you know, until you've really thought it through. So go through the check. Why did my opponent make that move, right? A couple of games, especially the guy I played at the end, you know, Tommy Tickle, um, who's now a chess.com friend, um, both of our games I had an edge, I think, and I think he would agree with that. And then both, my, both games I played a really, really sloppy move. So we had one with the um, Sicilian Grand Prix attack when I was white, and then the next game he played the Scotch and I played the Steinitz variation with um, Queen out, which surprised him. Um, queen out to here and um, I got a good position I was a pawn up and just played a couple of sloppy moves too quickly thinking oh, I can I can free wheel now and whatever because I've got an advantage and uh, you know he knew to knuckle down and uh, he, he won both games so there you go a fair play to him but it's yeah it's definitely teaching me a lesson I need to I need to get more serious and really concentrate on trying to cut out the weakest moves and the idea that these um, these kind of longer format, more classical games really do prove the fact that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So that's going in the old memory box, something to think about this week and the next two weeks. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you soon.